Hey there, Slack app developers. Hope you're having a great day. My name's Colm Doyle. My pronouns are he and him, and I'm a developer advocate on the Slack team. Today, I want to talk to you a bit about Tasks app. Well, what's Tasks app, you might say? Good question. Tasks app is a Slack app that we've built on the developer relations team to show off some best practices about how you go about building a Slack app. It doesn't matter if you're new to it or you're an old pro. Hopefully, there'll be something for everyone to learn from. Today, in this video, I'm mostly going to give you a tour of the code base, showing you the structure, explaining why we made certain decisions. Hopefully, by the end of it, you'll be able to dig into the entire code base and find every feature that we've built and how we've built it. But if you haven't, that's fine too, because we're going to release a new video every two weeks that'll deep, deep dive into one of those features. So let's get started by heading over to github.com slash slack API slash tasks dash app. Today, we're going to review the Node.js implementation of Tasks app, which is in the Node.js folder here. This is the root folder of the Node code base. It contains all the files that you might expect to see, such as a package.json, a readme, and a gitignore. The other notable file in the root is the manifest.yaml file. Let's start there. So manifest.yaml is a Slack app manifest file. It's a YAML representation of the various Slack app settings, like the display name, what features are enabled and more. You'll use this file to create a pre-configured version of the Tasks app on your own workspace. We'll cover how to do that in a separate video, but if you don't want to wait, the readme file contains all the information you'll need to get up and running. If we go back to the root, the app.js file is the entry point for all the app logic. And it will declare and initialize the app object, and you can see that here and here. We also initialize uh, SQLize, which is the ORM that we use for interacting with the database. You can see that there, as well as pointing to the various listeners which handle incoming requests from Slack. You can see those all through here. By design, we're trying to keep this file as lightweight as possible. Beyond the app and data store initialization, it's mostly going to recruit the, route the requests to the various methods we handle uh, app logic in. So now let's step back to the root of the code base. In this listeners folder here, we have an index.js file. And what that does is that exports all the modules for each of the subdirectories. And then we have a subdirectory for each category of listener. These folder names align with the features of the platform. So files in the events folder will handle API traffic from the events API. Shortcuts will handle invocation of Slack shortcuts and so on. So let's look at the pattern inside of the shortcuts folder. Again, we have an index.js file, which exports all the modules we declare. And if we open up that index.js file, you'll see that we take the app object that was declared in app.js, and we pass that to the shortcut method declared by Bolt for JavaScript. That method takes two arguments, a callback ID, which was declared in the app manifest file earlier, and a callback function, which is stored in a separate file. We handle the method call in this file because it allows us to isolate our logic in the other callback file, making it easier to test the callback code. And if we click through to this file, you'll see that the you'll see the logic. In this case, opening a modal, and you'll notice that the UI for the modal isn't declared in this file, and that's because we reuse user interface in various parts of the code base. So they're all stored in a standalone user interface folder, which I'll open up in a minute. If we go back to the shortcuts directory, you'll see there's an underscore underscore tests underscore underscore directory. And this is where we add tests for the callback code. And uh, these are unit tests, they're not integration tests. So we aren't testing all the pieces tied together, we're just testing the callback code. All the other listeners follow a similar pattern, so I won't cover them beyond that. But in other videos, we'll no doubt explore them. If we go back to the root directory, I'm going to briefly mention the models directory. And this is where we store the files that SQLize, the ORM we use, uses to understand the data structure of the objects in our app. Today, those objects are tasks and users, but we may add more in the future. If we look at the user.js file, you'll see that every user in our system has a one-to-many relationship with tasks objects. And then we also store the Slack user ID, the Slack organization ID, and the Slack workspace ID. Not every user will have an organization associated with them. 
but it is important for apps that want to support enterprise grid. In the videos about setting up these data structures, we'll go into more detail on how that works. The last major part of the tasks app code base is the user interface folder. So let's go to that now. All UI in a Slack app is built using what we call BlockKit. BlockKit gives you access to individual components we call blocks, and you use these blocks in what we call surfaces. There are three types of surface, app home, messages, and modals. So our user interface directory has a subdirectory for each of those. Let's look at the new task modal where users input the details of tasks they want to complete. We'll find that here in the modals directory and the new task file. On the first line here, you'll see that we include a repository called Slack Block Builder. Slack Block Builder is a community built library which allows you to use a Swift UI like syntax to generate the JSON that is eventually passed to Slack. Now there's no strict need to use a library like Block Builder. You could just write the JSON into the code itself. But using a library like this, and there are a couple to choose from, makes the code a bit more readable in my opinion. And that's a quick tour of the tasks app code base. If you've ever used a model view controller framework like Ruby on Rails, then hopefully the structure should feel somewhat familiar, albeit not identical. But if you've never used an MVC framework, you know what, that's fine too. Hopefully this code is well structured enough that you'll be able to navigate it by yourself. And like I said earlier, we're going to be releasing new videos every two weeks. So you'll be able to follow the series as we progress through it, building out the app video by video. If there's a new feature you want to implement or you have a question about how we've uh, approached anything in the tasks app, feel free to open an issue in the GitHub repository and we'll get back to you there. We're so glad you're part of our community and we can't wait to see what you built. Have a great day.